host, Adam Deacon, on the Serious Angler Network. And guys, today we've got an awesome guest. He's been on the Serious Angler show before with Bailey, uh, way back when Bailey had kind of just started things. So uh, excited to get John on. I have been, uh, man, it's been a, a long couple of weeks here. I went and fished uh, the team championship on Lake Eufaula, picked up a boat, and it has just been a absolute grind. Uh, that was some terrible fishing, and I was sick and everything else. Uh, I'm running a new boat, but... Anyways, got a new boat back home to Colorado, and um, but let's uh, let's get into the show with John here. We've got some cool stuff to talk about from the business side of things as well as fishing. Um, without further ado, let's see here. John, how's it going, man? Going great. Uh, thanks for having me on, guys. Looking forward to uh, to talking about some bass fishing and some business. Heck yeah, man. Heck yeah. Well, dude, you were luckily you were not too close to all the storms that ripped through Kentucky, man. Have you uh, driven by any of the devastation or seen any of that? I just out of curiosity, I know you're nearby somewhat, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, far Western Kentucky got the worst of it for sure. Um, we were lucky and the, the storm kind of dissipated out about 25, 30 miles South of us. Um, so we're, we were really lucky, you know, we just had some, you know, pretty normal thunderstorms and, and some lighter wind and some, you know, moderately heavy winds. Um, but it is really, really sad what happened down in uh, Western Kentucky, Bowling Green, the Kentucky Lake area. That's where, you know, uh, Maysville and uh, Benton, all those areas got got hammered and it, uh, it absolutely destroyed that place. And it's uh, extremely sad. A lot of people left with nothing. But uh, Kentucky's been been great. Everyone's rallying behind the communities and there's all kinds of uh, funds and relief funds and uh, you know, teams being assembled to go down and help. So it's, it's been cool seeing, seeing everyone, uh, rally around those communities and help them, help them get back on their feet. Heck yeah, man. No, I mean, it's, uh, some of the pictures I just uh, are unbelievable to me. Um, but glad to see, you know, especially in the angling community, a lot of people around Kentucky and just seeing a lot of people, like you said, kind of rallying and, um, getting boots on and going to help. So, uh, it's always kind of the silver lining in that stuff is to see that there's still, uh, some good people in the world, I suppose. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, well, dude, uh, kind of in the off season here for you, um, as far as fishing goes, I know you got a lot going, uh, outside of that, but, uh, I mean, how's that been for you? How is, uh, how's everything going from the off season standpoint, getting ready for 2022? Yeah, it's, uh, it's been good. Like I've already got my boat, um, which is kind of crazy. I was just telling you that, uh, earlier today, it's one of the earliest, years i can ever recall having a boat i got it in early november um which is wild but the only the only downside is this year getting all the equipment to go on you know poles ranch grass there a lot of the uh ships uh, cargo ships out off the coast of california have all the glass that go in the hgs live 12 units they have the actual um glass components and that's keeping the 12s on back order for you know quite some time now um, so it's kind of delaying a lot of my gear, but, uh, I think we're supposed to have anything, everything right around the new year. So I'll go down to uh, high tech outdoors down in Benton and, um, get it rigged up and we'll hit the road to, uh, Sam Rayburn sometime in January. Heck yeah, man. Well, great. Well, uh, so are you, is your, is your boat broken in at this point as far as the motor goes and you're just waiting to slap everything on there? Nope. I need to do that. Uh, it has, it, you know, I could go break it in. That's a good point. We could, yeah. we could be getting a leg up on that. Um, but uh, I only, I've had it in the water a couple times, actually. I never started the big engine. I went to a little lake by the house. It's where I go and get some content for sponsors. Um, and I've been out there a handful of times, just patrolling in the water, shoot videos, pictures. You know, I'll, I'll crank the big motor to load it. That's about it. <laughs> I see. Just loading it up on the trailer, man. That's awesome. Well, that's awesome. Well, man, um, let's get into kind of your story and everything that you've got going. Um, I'm sure that you had talked about some of this with Bailey. I did not listen to that show, but man, would love to, to, to hear your progression into a tour level angler. Um, and then we'll kind of take it from there. But what kind of was your jumping point and um, what was your thought process kind of like going into, okay, maybe this is something I really want to do. Yeah, that's it's a long story, but I'll try and keep it as condensed, short and sweet as I can. Um, I uh, I went to college on a uh, baseball scholarship. I always loved bass fishing, though. Traded my dirt bike for my first bass boat at the age of 16. 
started fishing local local jackpot tournaments here locally around the house never really left the state of kentucky ever hardly even my like 30 mile radius uh fishing through high school because that's just you know it's all the new and um no one in my family was really big into fishing immediate family was big into fishing my uncle was the one who got me into it but he lived uh pretty far away so i just stayed local fish played baseball love fishing never thought it could be a profession i just thought i'll get my school paid for through baseball. I'm going to focus mainly on that fish for fun. And, um, I did that and I found myself just wanting to fish more than I play baseball as I graduated, um, uh, college cause I was really getting into the tournaments. And so anyways, I go to college on baseball scholarship, realized that I just didn't love it. My coach quit that recruited me. So sophomore year, I decided to quit baseball and I'd met some awesome guys on their Georgetown college bass fishing team and joined the fishing team and uh yeah the rest was history i fell just all the way head first dove right into it and fell in love with it um it's actually where i met um one of my best friends of this day mike huff who fishes on the elite series yep uh, got, we were college partners uh my last year there so um learned a ton through that whole process got to travel the country see all kinds of new bodies of water uh, stumbled around, struggled first year or two, but really started to kind of catch, you know, catch my groove and, and, and figure, figure the tournament fishing out and figuring new bodies of water out and had a really strong senior, uh, senior campaign on the college circuit. Um, and, you know, and then I graduated and I hit that kind of point in my life. I think everyone, uh, hits when they graduate college and, uh, it's just kind of that, that oh crap moment. What what do I do now? Um, <laughs> and it's a it's a tough a tough point because uh, you know of course I wanted to fish, but you know that's kind of a pipe dream, right? Well, just maybe I need to go get a job. Um, so that's what I did. Um, my dad is in the commercial construction business, commercial construction. So I went and uh, worked a nine to five estimating job for him and hated every second of it it felt like jails and a cubicle i just I did not like it um and that's when i started thinking man i've got to try and go raise some money so that i can i can do some fishing um next season and so that's what i did i started you know calling people i knew businesses in town and luckily texas roadhouse which headquartered in louisville where i live um committed to helping me pay for some fishing tournaments in 2015. Mm. So I looked at the schedule that year and I wanted to do the Bassmaster Opens, um, but I could only get one set of them. So I said, you know what, I'm going to do the co-angler thing. Be a great way for me to learn, travel the country, get behind a pro, practice with a pro, and uh, try and try to figure out how to do this thing professionally and, and, and do the co-angler deal as well. So I did co-angler uh, on the FLW Tour and the Northern Opens uh, as a pro that year and gotcha. it's super blessed year. Everything, you know, kind of went my way, which is that's how it has to go sometimes to, to succeed in, in the sport. And when you are succeeding, that's how it goes. Um, and I won going over the year, had like four top tens, won a ton of money, won a boat. Um, and then I also qualified for the Bassmaster Elite Series as a pro on the Bassmaster Northern Opens. Wow. All in the same year. And uh, <clears throat> it was, uh, you know, I'll be honest and say that I probably was not ready <clears throat> just one year out of college making that kind of leap. But um, you do. You may, you just make that leap uh, in that scenario. And I would tell my young self to do it again and anyone in my shoes to do it again. Hmm. Uh, and especially since I was lucky enough to have Texas Roadhouse as a partner and they, they helped me, you know, with entry fees substantially uh, for the next year. And I had won all that money. So I was like, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to go for it. And uh, it's something that I'll never, never regret doing. And it's uh, what allowed me to get to where I am now, you know, seven years in, um, this will be my seventh year fishing, fishing professionally on a uh, national circuit and uh, loving every minute of it. Wow. Wow. That was pretty good, man. I don't know if I could have <laughs> said that it was going to con be condensed better than that without trying, man. That's crazy. <laughs> got it all in there. Well, dude, I mean, I guess one, one question I've got for you on the, on the co-angling 
piece. And I know it's different now, right? As far as you can't, there's no co-anglers on the tour. So mm -hmm. it's just really opens or Toyota series. Um, so I've had kind of, so I fished the a Toyota Plains division this last year on the, on the pro side, but then fished uh, some opens as a, as a co over the last mm -hmm. couple of years, just kind of one here and there. And um, I've had kind of some mixed thoughts on that, but wanted to get your thoughts on, uh, on that experience and especially probably with the practice involved with that stuff. But how crucial is that for you um, going through that process of taking the year and being like, Hey, I'm going to really sit behind a guy and, and mm -hmm. learn some stuff. I mean, what was that for you? Did you team up with anyone specifically yeah. for the whole year? And I will say, you know, if you're doing the co-angler thing, you're, you're going to get some, some learning, uh, you know, some learning opportunities out of the pros that you draw, but where you really learn is uh, teaming up with a good pro to travel with and another really good fisherman um, to get in the boat with and uh, kind of see how someone else does it and, uh, and learn, you know, there's always different ways uh, of doing things, especially in the sport of bass fishing. Um, so that's where I was fortunate. I was able to get with Spencer Shuffield, who is an absolutely just hammer, incredible, incredible angler. And, uh, I practiced with him that year. So learned a bunch from him. And then, uh, obviously I was able to learn a bunch from just the whole community. I traveled with Kyle Raymer who practiced with Jake Wheeler. So I was always, always able to kind of, you know, soak up what, what he was learning and just, it, you know, there's so, there's so many good fishing minds out there on the tour and even the opens um, as long as you can get in a, in a good group of guys who are open and, uh, and, and aren't a, aren't a closed book, then there's plenty, plenty of learning to, to be had and done. Yeah, dude, no, I, I, I agree. I mean, uh, to me, so uh, I, I went independent contractor for work this last over this last year and have been able to take more time and go practice in those co-angling situations. Mm -hmm. Whereas the year before it was like, all right, I have, you know, my typical vacation days. Like I'm going to have to go immediately mm -hmm. and to the event Thursday night show or Wednesday night, go to the meeting and then fish the event. It's like, well, I mean, I, I felt like that was not nearly as beneficial for me of just fishing the tournament. I honestly feel that literally going and practicing with a guy and then, uh, I mean, fishing the event's great or whatever, but as far as like the actual time learning, it was that practice for me. Um, sure. and, you, you can't know. substitute the time on the water. I mean, that's, that's, that's everything. <laughs> exactly. And also to me, just seeing how guys break down some of these bodies of water and have that viewpoint of, okay, he's going to, he's only got three days. What's he going to do? Or maybe he's got a little bit more than that. And, um, trying to fully understand, uh, you know, how to do something like that on some of these big bodies of water quickly is probably something that, uh, I'm definitely trying to learn more about. Yeah, absolutely. What you'll find is everybody's different. You know, um, you may be able to learn from something that this guy and it works really well for him, but mm -hmm. it may not work really well from you. And the only way you're going to learn that is, is by going and, uh, watching something work a time or two or watching things not work a time or two or three. Um, <laughs> After, after you do, you, you see that you're like, you know what? And you got to sit, you know, a lot of reflecting time behind the wheels of bass fishermen. You get to really sit there and go, you know, what kind of event did I have? Was it a good event? What did I do in my practice? What did I, what decisions did I make here? And, uh, and why did I make them so that I can, you know, if they were good ones and I need to be able to repeat that in the future. Sure. Sure. Man, that makes a lot of sense. So going back into your, your starting here. So your springboard is your 2015 season. Mm -hmm. and uh that got you to where look i have some money in the bank now i can uh, roll this into tournaments and i have some supporting sponsors so you know off air we discussed kind of a lot of your different ventures man which is just a ton of stuff outside of fishing i don't know how you manage all that but <laughs> anyways like all your stuff going i mean what really uh made you decide okay look maybe i do need to have something outside of fishing for the lifestyle that you want to live yeah. Uh, what did, uh, what did that look like and where did that kind of start for you? So, uh, yeah, like you said, I'm, I made some money 2015. I was still living in mom and dad's basement, which there's no shame in that a year and a half out of you know, year out of college, Heck yeah. um, you know, save, save money while you can. Um, so I had a, a nice little nest egg and I entered my, my first year in the elite series and had most of it covered once again, super thankful for, for that. Um, that doesn't happen to everybody. I was just very blessed in the, the spot I was in with the relationship I have with, with 
with Tex Roadhouse. So anyhow, I had most of it covered. Did did my rookie year in the Elite Series and, and struggled. Had a good tournament or two, but for the most part, you know, got my ass kicked and uh, learned a lot. Um, and after that year, I kind of just said, man, you know, I'd had a great college season, a great year on the Opens, a great year at Co Angler. And I thought I was just going to go out there and, Walk you know, in. <laughs> slam Kevin Van Dam. You know, I'll just, you know, I'll have a great year standing beside you all fishing, you know, and, and, and I, I learned that that wasn't the case. Um, and so I kind of, I kind of started to think, you know, man, there's, I need to have some supplemental income. Um, I was getting to that point in my life where I wanted to buy a house. I wanted to move out of parents' basement. Um, and I was, there's was something I was super passionate about and it was real estate. Um, so I started and my dad flipped some homes as a hobby growing up aside from his commercial construction. And my mom was a realtor growing up. And, uh, you know, I, so I inherently, I knew a ton about houses. I just, mm -hmm. I knew a lot about it and I liked them. I liked looking at them. I like, you know, I just liked houses. And, um, so I start my 2017 season, my second season. And uh, I don't make a check in the first event, I'm like man. And then I think I make a check in the second event. I'm like, this is just too volatile. I, I love fishing and I want to put time to it, but I need I need another way. And so that's when I took a bunch of my savings and I went and uh, did my first flip house um, in winter of 2016 um, into uh, spring of 2017. And thankfully, it was it was a success. And I said, I want to do more of these. And so. I started taking that money and doing another and another. And next thing you know, I think 2018, I, from 2017, to 2021, I've probably flipped 20 something houses or 25, a bunch of 20, yeah. 20 something properties for, you know, four or five a year. Um, so that's been a, it's been a good source of, of income for me on the side. Um, but then I also got licensed in real estate so that I could, uh, you know, buy and sell properties uh, for myself and for, you know, friends, family, clients, and all that good stuff. Um, so real estate was, uh, was big for me, uh, to take some pressure off my fishing. Um, you know, I was still able, and it was what I love about that business. It was part-time. Um, it was kind of, you know, it could go on my time so I could still dedicate my time to my sponsors off the water and, uh, pre-practice my tournaments and still, uh, be successful in my real estate investing, uh, business back home. Um, yeah. And then eventually I started building some home that, you know, it kind of, it's kind of a slippery slope and you start doing that and you're like, want to get into everything. And so I started actually building some homes a year ago and, uh, I'm uh, built some, building some spec houses now. And, uh, yeah, so that's the, kind of the real estate side of, of my business back home. Yeah. And, uh, I, I love it. <laughs> that's awesome, man. No. And, um, so kind of connection there. I'm, I'm in the real estate industry, uh, as well. And, and that's always kind of been a passion of mine. Uh, I'm curious, do you have now when you're saying, when you're looking for these investment style properties and you are, um, on the road or in between events now, how, how are you able to, I guess when it's an investment situation, it's a little bit different because you can kind of control, okay, I'm going to look at this situation. I'm going to go look at this place when I'm back or something. And then, um, then you're putting contractors in place to fix it up and, and that kind of a thing. But how has that been able, how are you able to manage that at an event or are you doing that after the event? Do you have an assistant? What does that look like for you? No, you nailed it. I mean, at first it was tough, but, um, now I've kind of, uh, built rapport with my, my team of contractors. And, you know, once you have systems, it, it kind of becomes, I don't want to say hands off, but it becomes second nature to do these, to do these projects. So, you know, you know, uh, Pedro is going to paint and, uh, you know, Martin's going to do the drywall and you, you just know immediately who's going to do this, who's going to do this. And you have a relationship with these guys, so you know, they're going to show up, you know, they're honest to you. And that, that's really, everything is, ha is having a good team. So I've been able to, to build a good team that uh, I respect them. They respect me. We have a great relationship. So they show up um, and they do great work and uh, it makes me look good in the end. And uh, I try and take care of them and make sure that they're, they're, they're taken care of and happy and it kind of works for everyone. Um, but yeah, systems, uh, 
processes and team is everything, you know, uh, surround yourself with, with, with good people and, uh, you know, you'll, you'll get good results. Yeah, no, man. Well, I, I appreciate that insight. And I think that a lot of people, uh, kind of try and, and maybe take too much on themselves in those kind of situations. And it seems like the, the move to scaling up is, is utilizing people and respecting people like you're saying. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that is uh, some great advice for kind of listeners on the show, trying to build businesses or anything like that is to, to surround yourself with the team. Yep. Absolutely. Absolutely. Sweet. Well, man, let's get into a little bit about uh, your, uh, so real estate business, let's call that the real estate umbrella, right? You got all these yeah. different things going in the real estate world. Now you also have kind of pushed into the fishing industry, uh, from the business side, not just the, the fishing side. What does that look like for you over the last couple of years? Yeah. Um, so after I got the real estate game going, um, I was like, you know what, man, I'm really kind of itching to get into, you know, the industry that I, that I've work in and I love and I grew up loving and see outdoors. And, um, I was sitting at home one day and I'm notorious for, this was in 2018, I believe. Yeah. 2018, um, sitting at home and I'm notorious for cracking my phone screen and I'd cracked like two in a row. And, um, I'm like, man, I need to start putting screen protectors on here. And then I saw I was on Bass Boat Central or something. And, I saw somebody talking about a cracked uh, graph helix unit. And I was mm -hmm. like, hmm, why are these not made for those? And I started doing some research and I couldn't find anything. And I was like, dude, this is crazy. So I start getting on Alibaba and Global Source and um, looking like who's the manufacturers. I'm sure it's the same, just, you know, just cell phone screen manufacturers got to be able to make this. And then, you know, and then I was like, holy crap, I'm not going to spend like a bunch of my savings to try and order some of this and not know the people. So then I book a, pl a plane ticket to China in the fall of, or in the winter of 17, early 18, I fly to China, uh, get a hotel room in Hong Kong, take a, take a, a subway across the border into Guangdong and, <laughs> go meet with these factories and um, meet with them. And it was a super neat cultural experience because let me tell you, it's like, I mean, that's it's third world. It really is like yeah. in China, you're not Hong Kong's like LA. Of China. It's a different country. Like it, it's a different, and it's totally different. It's super nice, but you go into mainland China and it's, it's pretty neat, man. It was a learning experience from many different angles. But mm -hmm. I settled on a manufacturer, we sized them, I came back home, ordered them, got them. And that's when uh, the company Graph Glass was born. That's and awesome. uh, we did exactly that. We imported and manufactured screen protectors for fish finders. Um, and uh, next thing I know, I had two or 3,000 units of inventory sitting in sitting at the house and uh, i was like oh crap i gotta figure out a way to sell all this yeah <laughs> so i started uh i started you know creating ads and uh running facebook ads and calling up um all the buddies and in the industry and other fishermen hey man you know i don't I'm not asking if you like it just you know share it if not throw it away it just just a lot of phone calls and uh and thankfully it was uh it was a hit and people liked the product and uh I sold a bunch of them that year. Um, well, I guess after that, after that year, I, uh, I got to where that was taking up a lot of my time, almost too much of my time. And I wasn't going to be able to grow it effectively. So, mm -hmm. uh, I, I sold majority of my, uh, I kept a minority, minority share in the company and sold majority of it to, um, the leash and precision sonar. Um, and they run it and they're doing a great job of growing the brand and, uh, doing great things with it. So that was my journey with, uh, with graph glass and, uh, been, uh, it's been good to me. And, uh, we're, we're looking at, at some more little endeavors in the outdoor industry here in the near future. Heck yeah, man. Well, here's a, here's a picture for, this was on the, uh, Toyota series on grand this year, practicing for it. 
That's uh, that's a oh garment my. <laughs> without a uh, graph glass. That was a yeah. a two point five square bill on a, a a small boat, eighteen and a half foot ledge, and I swung back in the wind and smoked it, dude. I mean, mm. I don't, I, I mean, I don't know if I could have hit it harder. This <laughs> the square bill exploded, but uh, would have been nice to have that there at the time. Yeah, I'll get you. I'll get you a set for sure. There you go. <laughs> I'll get you. Uh, we've never had one. We've had glass break, so like we've had people hit it and the actual screen protector break, which is what it's supposed to do. Yeah, exactly. Um, but we've yet to have one peel off and the actual glass be broken. So, wow. so far, so good. <laughs> that's that's awesome, dude. Mm -hmm. Man, well, one question about that. So when you when you sold your majority interest and now you're a minority interest, so do you just sit on the board with the company? What's kind of your role at that point? Or are you literally just collecting royal like your yeah, royal? You Yep. You, when, like, when we decide and I, the guys, and I made sure, you know, I mean, cause you gotta be careful when you're exiting a business and you're agreeing to take a minority, minority shareholder position and give up your majority is mm -hmm. they can really like run, run you out pretty much like, sure. uh, with operate. They can, you know, they can inflate operating expenses and run profits to zero so that your dividends are nothing. Mm -hmm. But, Luckily, I was able to get with the right guys who do things right, and they're you know investment minded, and they want the business to kick off cash and cash flow so that they can so that they can get dividends as well. So sure. uh, yeah, so luckily I found some some awesome guys: Jared Swift, Josh Honaker, Alan Beard, partner with, and uh, everyone's kind of on the same same page there. And yeah, we just. Every 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 quarter, we we split up the dividends in the company, and obviously keep some funds in there to continue with uh with growth. But yeah, I, I'm pretty hands off. I'll try and help with some marketing, some some ads, but no day to day. You know, maybe once a month conference calls. It's a pretty good program. Sure, sure. That's awesome, man. Um, and I know, like you said, you're you're looking at some stuff, uh, some additional stuff. Sounds like your mind's always uh, yeah. always looking at the next thing in the outdoor industry. Yeah. Um, man, well, uh, we should uh, for sure have you on when you go to head and uh, get on to your next stuff, man. Or or you and your partners would be cool to uh, showcase uh, what you're yeah. looking forward to. Do you want to tease any of it right now for 2022? Yeah, we're uh, we're developing um, a uh, a hydration product for outdoorsmen and, and athletes. Um, most of us live our lives um, dehydrated every day. And a lot of people don't know the effects that it has on your body. I mean, it can affect your mood, um, obviously your physical performance, headaches. It can affect your focus, you know, your, 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 your brain functionality. There's so much things that being, uh, being hydrated can, can do for you in a positive way. And, uh, a lot of people live, I would say, um, actually, we know a majority of people live dehydrated. So we're, we're trying to combat that and fix that issue so that uh, people can operate at peak performance every day and live a happier, healthier lifestyle. And I guess that's all I'll say. We're, we're, we got some really cool products coming out. Cool, man. Cool. Yeah. Well, dude, um, no, I think that's such an important thing and, um, especially both. So, uh, I, I still run a decent amount now and, and lift, a lift when I can. And, but for, in, I guess it would have been 2019, I ran a marathon and trained to run a marathon and all this kind of stuff. And, uh, dude, like as far as staying hydrated was half the battle. Like if you, if you weren't, if you were not eating properly and especially drinking enough training like you were in serious trouble man and uh that uh is such a big deal and it's a big deal on the water especially when you're in 90 degrees and 90 percent humidity like it just it drains you so quick absolutely man you nailed it and good for you marathon thanks man yeah i'd like to i'd like another crack at one man uh one day but dude it is so much time i mean you're looking yeah. at 10 15 hours a week at training mm -hmm. I'm supposed to do a half and I've never, you know, I've done lots of five Ks, 10 Ks, but I've never done a half and I'm supposed to do one this year. So, uh, I'm yeah. a, I'm like a novice runner. I can, you know, I can run five, six miles, but it starts getting up there, man. It gets, gets tough. <laughs> yeah, dude, I'm with you. I will. And the, the year I did that, dude, I mean, I'm not a runner by any means. I didn't run in high school or college mm -hmm. or anything. And I just was like, man, I'm going to start with a, 5k then do a 10k then do a half and then do a full in a year and um just working up slowly helped a lot in those uh 
those long runs, but your body gets used to it just like it's anything crazy, else. But your, how quick your body um, can adapt and, and learn, you know, and, and teach itself to, to recover and, and get better and faster. It's just, it's amazing. My buddy, my neighbor across the street mm -hmm. never ran, has never ran. He used to lift. You know, he played baseball in high school, but never was a runner ever. His yeah. wife ran some, and uh, but he's somebody who's like, you know, when he commits to something, he's pretty stubborn and commits to it. And um, he said, "I'm gonna I'm gonna run a marathon this year." And I was like, "I believe you," but <laughs> he goes, "He goes, but I can't even run a mile right now." And this was mm, not even a month. He goes, "Well, I'm gonna go attempt one today." And he finished my own 12 and a half minutes. Wow. Well, 13 minutes. So that's pretty, you know, he didn't. Literally didn't, not run. Not running the whole time, you know, oh. probably if you're doing a 13 or 14, you know. Oh, yeah. So, and that was one. So it's been a month and he ran two miles in like 22 minutes the other day. So like that just shows you like how quick. And he was like, I won't be able to run. He'll be next week. He's going to run. You know, he'll be at three miles. I told him he'll be at a 5K in a month and a half. Mm -hmm. it's just wild how how fast somebody can go from never being a runner to you know a 30 minute 5k dude your body's crazy i agree and like uh for me i had just started running two to three miles a week and then i picked up a training plan and like the first week it was like the, your long run was six miles and it was like dude i don't know if i can run six miles are you kidding me well, and i did it <laughs> yeah exactly it was like i did that a 10 minute 11 minute mile or something yeah. and, and it and, and it like happened and then you go to the next one and the next one. But, uh, yeah, it was, uh, it was an experience for sure. And, uh, like right now it would be so, so hard, but it is crazy how, uh, consistency and your, your body adapts and it would, uh, it just takes time to get, mm -hmm. to get back into it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, dude, let's, uh, kind of, we'll, we'll start towards wrapping things up. I know you kind of got to get out of here later, but, uh, what, uh, I've noticed you've really put a lot of dedication into your social media, into your YouTube. Um, you know, as far as like your photo content is incredible. What does that, uh, look like for you? How have you been able to, or where did you see the value in, in really diving in on that stuff as an angler? Yeah, that's a good point. Um, you know, there's, there's, there's different anglers in the world. Um, and you have guys like, uh, Patrick Walters and, uh, you know, Brian thrifts and dudes who are gonna win a tournament every year and they just are, and they do it. And, you know, a lot of us, you know, I just eventually looked in the mirror and said, I'm not one of those guys, you know, I'm competitive. Can I win a tournament? Yes. Do I believe I'm going to win a tournament? Yes, I do. I've been very close numerous times and, you know, just the right things didn't happen for, for it to, for me to get there and hold a trophy, um, or the big trophy. Um, and I just realized that I'm probably not going to win one every year. So I have to find other ways to bring substantial value to my partners and sponsors and, uh, simply putting a logo on a Jersey and a boat is, that that is a thing of the past they don't even most people don't even care about it um they need you to bring value in other ways and that is moving product for them and creating direct brand awareness getting eyes to their websites getting eyes to their online platforms um into their into their stores into their online shops um and the only way you're doing that is content content creation videos and help you know that, that's the way um a sticker on the jersey doesn't do it um and what tournaments what tournaments you fish and how you finish a lot of times doesn't do it either um don't get me wrong if you're you know if you're performing well then people's eyes are on you and you're getting press and that all helps but uh you know being creative making people want to follow you and want to see what you're doing is going to make you more valuable to sponsors because those eyeballs are on you, which give you the platform to, uh, to help them grow their brand. And that's, you know, I realized that I wish I had, a, I, there was guys, you know, you look at a guy like Brandon Polinick, um, who's mm -hmm. a hammer, he's going to win one a year, but he also, and Jacob Wheeler's another one, hammer going to win one a year, but those dudes also realized, you know, two or three years before everybody, how important this was, which is why, you know, those two are like the pinnacle of 
of uh, of probably, I would say, you know, sponsor uh, value guys. You know, those are those sure. people are super valuable to to the brands they work with, and uh, that's because they they got on it early. They saw the value in it. They invested in it because it's cost money. Um, they invested time and money in, into into building those their their brand and their media media outlets. And uh, I realized it probably about two two and a half years ago, sometime in you know late 2019, that man, I need to get. Or I no, I take that back. It was before the 2019 seasons when I said, you know what, video game stepping up. We're gonna put a lot more time and money into this and. Uh, and, and try and do things right. And it's, uh, it's been great. It's helped all my, all my partners out and, uh, helped my brand out as well. For sure, man. No, I, I uh, it's the trendsetters, right? Like those guys are the guys that are there because they were there first, but there's, n- there's nothing uh, wrong with getting in there late and doing it because you need to anyways. You know what I mean? I, in my opinion, unless you're, like you said, one, of, I call them the I don't know. I'd call them even five to 10 percenters on any, on any tour that are, that are guaranteed. Like you said, going to win one, one a year, or if they don't, they're going to have a pretty dang good year financially. And those guys like your, that you just mentioned are those guys, but they also realized how much of a platform they could make uh, early on, which is important. Yeah. And that's where there's a difference. And I, I don't want to say names, but there's, there's a difference in other dudes who are great fishermen, and they win one a year. And then you've got the dude who wins one a year and has the media going, and he's like double the value or more to a sponsor, a non-endemic and endemic company. So um, it just, you know, it it's just, it's the value. I can't even like describe how much value um, it, it brings to to your, your personal brand, fishing brand. Well, and, and to me too, like you said, that double value or more, but really it's exponential over time. I mean, when you start seeing that growth, like if you look at like career earnings from a, from an angling standpoint and a sponsorship standpoint, the guys, the bigger platforms are going to have a way, way higher, like overall career earnings. If you look at their combined income for a 30 year career. And that will, and like you said, going forward, that will be even more of a staple. Like you look at dudes in the past. Who or who got in the game twenty years ago? Like those dudes are going to make money forever because their royalties are going to carry on for their base. Mm-hmm. Um, so like you know Shaw Grigsby and you know some of these dudes who are just legends and they before social media was a thing they got all these royalty deals and these bait deals and you know it's going to make them money forever. But those are becoming uh, you know a dime a dozen. Not as many not as many of those programs out there. So. Uh, being able to sell product and move product through your, through your personal platforms is very important. The move. I like it, man. Well, dude, let's get into your 2022 season, man. What are your plans? Uh, do you have any, um, anything outside of, are you fishing the tack warehouse pro circuit again, or are you fishing the opens? What's your plan for 2022? Yeah, man, I'm doing, uh, two divisions of the opens. I uh, was going to do all three, but I'm getting married this year. Congrats. Uh, congrats. Exciting. Thank you. I'm getting married in September. Uh, right uh, when the final uh, final event of the Northern Open Series is, so I uh, had to had to uh, do away at the Northerns, which was uh, unfortunate, but for good reason. Obviously, you know, obviously. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So I'm doing the Centrals and the Southern Opens, and then I'm doing yes, I'm doing the uh, Major League Fishing Pro Circuit again. I'm um, looking forward to look forward to all of them. We get started the third week of January in Texas on mm-hmm. uh, Sam Rayburn, and that place is did me wrong the last time i was there so i'm ready to get some redemption heck yeah man heck yeah well is the wedding going to mess up your elk hunting i know you come out to call it is, it is. Oh, it is. yep it is wow. uh, yeah it's uh it, it's pretty depressing i'm gonna try and swing it there's like it's you know we're there for five days usually and maybe can go for four i gotta really i'm gonna really look at the calendar hard in the coming months and see if i can still See if I can still swing it out because I will be depressed if I can. Yeah, dude. I mean, that archery elk hunting man is my like. I I grew up hunting and hunt waterfowl and deer and all kinds of stuff, but that's my peak, man. That is as fun as it gets. And of course, it's always that one one time of the year 
So it does not get any better than archery elk hunting. I grew up in the whitetail woods and like I, my, my last couple of years, whitetail hunting have been pretty anticlimactic just because I go like just all my energy gets spent elk hunting. And I just, you know, I come home like, eh, <laughs> <laughs> whitetail. Yeah. Maybe a little bit during the rut. Exactly. Dude. That, well, that's it. Yeah. And that's, um, that's it, man. Calling a bull in is like nothing else. Even just small bulls and everything, just watching bulls come in is the most exciting thing to me. Mm-hmm. Yep. Well, awesome, man. Well, dude, we'll go ahead and get things wrapped up here. Uh, what I like to ask guests at the end of every show, three things. Um, so first your biggest, uh, small mouth spotted bass, large mouth, where you were, when you caught them, what you caught them on. Okay. Biggest large mouth was actually in practice for the open this past year. No way. Yep. On uh Harris chain. I was going to say somewhere in Florida, probably nine, two. I had a nine, one in 2020 at Chickamauga, mm. uh, but nine, two, I still have not caught a 10 pounder and it bothers me. <laughs> everyone, all like everyone I fish with, like, oh, and Kelly caught a 10 pounder in practice. Everyone's caught multiple 10 pounders. I have it. Yeah, I um, hooked a couple. But anyhow, uh, largest spot of bass was this year on Smith Lake. I caught a uh, six. Uh oh, I'm gonna forget. It was a six, like a six two. Six That's a giant two, spot. Six and a quarter spot. Wow. Um, on a wacky worm under dock. <laughs> of course. I um, thought I had a striper because I caught a striper <laughs> on a wacky worm under dock. Just, really? Yeah, really wow. wild. Yeah. And it felt about like that. <laughs> yeah. That's uh, wicked, dude. Yep. And then biggest smallmouth, I've weighed nothing like crazy. I've weighed some six pounders, you know, just touch over six. I know I had one that was like six and a half or better when I was fishing, practicing for the Elite Series in St. Lawrence like four years ago. Mm-hmm. There was like four dudes around me making similar drifts. And it was like, like I just got it up to the side and I was like, oh my god it was way different looking than any like i've caught big small like this thing was like big big like yeah probably at least a six and a half but i just i just i didn't weigh it i just unhooked it and let it go i kind of wish i'd have weighed it but that's my biggest we'll just call it six and a half but i like it but you don't really know dude i'm the same way when there's boats around in the derby i get so like i don't even look at it you know like it would be like a team term or something and you throw it in the live well with buddy and just be like I don't know how big was it. I have no idea. I threw it yeah. way in later, like <laughs> five hours. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's bigger than what we think. Yeah, yeah, man. Well, dude, uh, to wrap things up, I'm looking like red. This is crazy. I wonder if this. I got a sunset going on here. But uh, anyways, uh, man, to to wrap things up, the last thing I guess any any big piece of advice you've given away a lot of stuff here as far as uh, combining this whole fishing and business and sponsorship everything in your career thus far any big pieces of advice to anyone kind of looking to build something that, the way that you have in a career with and kind of multiple different revenue yeah yeah i mean and like i said earlier surround yourself with with good people and if you you know if you don't know how to do something just just ask and, and be open to learning uh educate yourself and uh work hard man and, and good things will happen um Awesome. Awesome. Well, John, thanks for coming on, man. I appreciate you taking the time out. I know you're a busy guy even in the off season here. So I uh, appreciate it and can't Not wait to follow along with everything uh, you've got going in 2022. Anything you want to, uh, to shout out, I guess, right now, as far as how guys can follow along with your career and everything you got going. Yeah. Yeah. We're going to do some more cool things on YouTube this year. It's uh, John Hunter fishing is my channel. And then uh, I'm on Instagram at J Hunter fishing. And uh, Facebook is John Hunter Fishing as well. So yeah, if you guys want to follow along? We'll try and keep putting out some some good content and uh, trying to show kind of the raw behind the scenes what it's like on the tour. We're doing a doing a, a, a very high, highly well produced vlog every tournament um, called the Limitless Series, um, and just kind of shows all the all the emotion and thought and practice and hard work and ups and downs, everything that goes into tournament fishing. We try and expose it all there. Um, also do some how to's and little bait breakdowns. So yeah, give it, check it out and, uh, subscribe and, uh, give me a follow. 
Heck yeah. Awesome, man. Well, I'll go ahead and link that in the bottom of the podcast as well as the YouTube notes, guys. Um, so anyways, man, have a good rest of your evening and uh, appreciate you coming on. Yeah, thanks, Adam. Thanks for having me. Absolutely.